unable to... I, I have to tap dance for about five seconds because at precisely 10 o'clock, which is right now, we get existing home sales and the number is... Drum roll, please. Yeah, Drum roll! Da, da, da. What was that? What was that? 5.48 million existing home sales on an annualized basis. That's the highest rate since the year 2007. Up 1.7% August versus July. Okay, 5.48 million homes per year being sold. That's existing homes being sold. Tanya Marchio is with us. That's not a bad number, is it, Tanya? I'm extremely happy because I think that we were going to see existing home sales go down a little bit. Mm. So this is a great number for housing. Now, I don't know whether it's investors who are doing the buying or whether it's uh, youngsters, 20 or 30 somethings, families buying a house, uh, a home, as opposed to investors buying a house. Uh, do you have any breakdown? Uh, your customers, you sell real estate, they're investors, aren't they? All of them. Not all of them, but a lot of my clients are investors, including a lot of big funds. And we're seeing a lot of pools come back to the market that these funds are picking up. So, yes, those numbers are being inflated by investors. Now, you must be celebrating Ben Bernanke keeping on printing money because mortgage rates are going to come down a little bit. And there's an awful lot of money sloshing around out there. You're nodding your head sagely. You just love Ben, don't you? You know, it's a bittersweet because I know that there's a fallout in the end with inflation, but it's great for housing right now because we have to get first time home buyers back into the market. You and I talk about it all the time. We have to encourage people to buy homes that are going to live in them. I love my investors. I love selling investment properties. I love renting them, that, renting them out. That is money in my pocket. That is money in my investor's pocket. But we have to get to a market where people who are living in these homes are buying them. Now, it occurs to me that maybe the pace of existing home sales is slowing down a bit, up 1.7% in August over July versus a 6% gain in July over June. Now, you could read that as a mild negative that maybe things are slowing down a little bit. I don't expect that you've seen that because you've, you've got all these investors clamoring to give you some money. But you've got to admit, that may be a bit of a slowdown, huh? It's my favorite word on your show, stabilization. We are starting to see the housing market stabilize, and that's a good thing. I'm going to keep saying it because we don't want to see large spikes. Large spikes do mean that we could come back down. What we want to see is a steady number in housing. And you think that's what we're seeing, don't you? I do. I think that that little pullback from 6% to 1.7% is a good thing. The other thing that I thought was really interesting this last week was that the Mortgage Bankers Association came out and said that applications were up 11%. Yeah, now, sorry. I think that that may be because Ben was about to raise the rate, we thought. But that's a good thing because mortgages are coming back as well, where 30% of this market has been cash. Okay. All right. Um, I'll, I've got to go to Nicole for a second. I want to see the home builders after these existing home sale numbers. And by the way, Freddie Mac just came out and said the 30-year fixed rate loan is pegged at 4.50%. It was 457 last week. So come on in, Nicole. Home builders, please. Looking better now after these numbers just came in, these latest group of numbers. You can see Pulte and Hovnanian have moved into the green ever so slightly. Moments before this, they were all to the downside. Now, of course, they had huge gains yesterday. Yesterday, as everybody, you know, the Fed kept everything the same. Everybody thought mortgage rates would now be lower. So the group overall reacted to the Fed news and took off. Today, I think it was a wait and see mode on this news that we just got in. And since it was uh, good, you see the market now, they're mixed now. Some of them actually moved into the green. All right, Nicole, thanks very much indeed. I've got Nicole, uh, I'm sorry, I've got uh, Tanya standing by. Uh, we're going to talk to her about that Fisker car, which she bought and took advantage of uh, my subsidy. So hold on, Tanya. We're going to talk to you about that for a second. Well, there. We're paying for satellite time, for heaven's sake, so we'd better use it. <laughs> hey, Tanya, uh, we've got a bone to pick with you. You are a Fisker <laughs> owner. You still got it. Yes? I love my Fisker. Yeah, I love I my Fisker. thank okay. the Americans. <laughs> I, I want a little bit of background here. This is why we're dealing with this story. The, the Energy Department is selling the $192 million loan that it made back in 2009 to Fisker. It's selling it. It'll probably get pennies on the dollar because Fisker is not in good shape. So you are taking advantage of my taxpayer subsidy. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. 
<laughs> Stuart, you make me feel so bad on this one, and I love my car so much, and I've already thanked the American public for all that they've done. <laughs> but I do think that we're going to recoup pennies on the dollar. I am sorry all to all those Americans who put taxpayers' dollars in, but I do love my car. <laughs> Does it uh, seriously? I mean, it, it goes fast. It's smooth. It's quiet. It uh, doesn't run out of juice. Yeah. You, you know, I had a nice Mercedes before that, and I love Mercedes Benz, but I will never not buy an electric car again. It is the most amazing thing I have ever purchased, and I have an F-150, so I balance it out when it comes to gas and everything else, but I absolutely love my Fisker. You, really? You, you'll never buy another non-electric car again? Really? No. Honestly, it, it is amazing. First of all, I put in $30 of gas and I get 450 miles. I get to drive in the carpool lane. I mean, this whole thing is amazing. I can go into the office at 8 a.m. when everybody's sludging through traffic and I'm not. So, um, you've made so much money, but you're still worried about the price of gasoline. I think that's absolutely incredible. That's why you make money in the first place, right? Yeah. And, and the rest of the economy, right, at this point, when you, Ben doesn't even believe in it. You get all this free advertising from Varney and company, and you get a subsidy <laughs> from us all, and you walk away laughing. All right, Tanya, you're out of here. I, 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 don't, I don't know how this gets any better, Stuart. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. All right, Tanya, good stuff. Thanks very much indeed. New revelations in the IRS scandal. The Daily Caller reporting that the targeting of Tea Party groups was inspired by coverage in the Washington Post. Liz, you've got to give me this story because I don't get it. Yeah, this shows that the IRS takes its cues from Washington Post columnists. <laughs> uh, basically, they're essentially saying that the, uh, the, the IRS workers were t looking more closely at Tea Party groups because of the media coverage of Tea Party groups. What did the Washington Post and say? And they're essentially equating them, some colonists are equating them to militia groups, saying that they were smoldering with anger, uh, equating them with the brand of patriotism, get this, equating them to the Ku, uh, Ku Klux Klan. So I'll tell you something, for the IRS to be doing this, we know that the IRS for decades has, has been using the media reports to direct what it does. Why not stick to the law? Why not stick to what the law says sure. about whether or not they can do educational things like the Tea Party groups were trying to do? I don't think that the IRS...